Hey, what's going on you guys? Welcome back to another episode with iTrack. Big shout out to all the iTrack fam, man. I appreciate you guys. If this is your first time here, what we like to do is take a look at the most interesting and creepy TikToks and kind of evaluate for ourselves whether these are fact or fiction. If you haven't already, do me a favor and smash that like button for me. Smash that subscribe button. Let's just go ahead and get into it. The McDonald's Corporation just had an ad come out a few months ago looking into research and development in a technology that will afford them the ability to pump their commercials into your brain while you're sleeping. Do you think that they figured this out or some other company figured it out first? You think if they're going to have this available to them next year, you think that there weren't agencies that have been wielding this for a decade or so? Where can I read about this? It's immediately available on the internet. Imagine when if they can do that next year, who's been doing it for the last decade or so? Now when we look around the world and we see everybody acting the way that they are acting, let's consider that these intrusive thoughts have already been present. These are the weapons of war contemporarily. It's very unfortunate. It used to be that war was a bit more noble when we selected people, we put them in uniforms, we sent them over there to the battlefield and we said fight for us. Now unfortunately, they've circumnavigated the battlefield. Nobody's dressed in uniforms anymore and the front line is every neighborhood that we're in. It's just that now the average mortgage payer is in the line of fire. Man, he made a very good point. If they're about to introduce this, that means they've been doing it and they know that it works. So if what he's saying is true, that'd be very creepy. It just made meat from your number two. Japanese scientists have developed a method to create edible steaks from human feces. Unbelievable? Well, it's happening. Mitsuyuki Aikida, a researcher at the Okoyama Laboratory, collaborated with Tokyo Sewage to address sewage mud excess. They discovered the content in the mud contains high protein due to bacteria. So, the team isolated and combined these proteins with a reaction enhancer. Result? Synthetic steak. The meat comprises of 63% protein, 25% carbs, 3% lipids, and 9% minerals. And it's visually enhanced with food coloring for a red hue and improved flavor using soy protein. No. Just no. I, I'm good. Let me know in the comments if that's something you'd be down for. But for me, no. The FBI just purchased 5,000 license for this program called Babel X. Babel X is like, I don't know if you guys remember, I used, I talked about last October, this program called Fog Data Reveal Service. It's basically the same thing. All your social media, your social security numbers, your uh, personal uh, records is in this database. You guys look it up. It's from Babel Street. It's called Babel X. And the FBI just bought 5,000 licenses to use this platform to gather information on random citizens whenever they want. And they can do it without a warrant. And imagine if Babel X, all the data in there was connected to this blockchain address, which is 100% identified to you because it's your literal DNA footprint. And so that's what I was thinking. In the future, all this gathering of DNA may be just a way to permanently identify you because they can sequence that into a blockchain. And then once we all are on this federal blockchain, our addresses are literally going to be our DNA sequence. Elon Musk has just implanted his Neuralink brain chip in a human being, but the darker agenda behind this will give you chills. Elon Musk first broke the news on his Twitter account stating that the first human being had received their brain implant and is recovering well. However, many people felt uneasy about this announcement, citing fears that this technology could be used for diabolical reasons. While Musk has often tried to portray this as a positive advancement towards society, the real motivation behind this is utterly satanic. This is called transhumanism, which is the belief or theory that the human race can evolve beyond its current physical and mental limitations, especially by means of science and technology. The Luciferian elite have long awaited for this moment because the ulterior sinister motive with merging man with machine is the final act of rebellion towards God. Transhumanistic technology promises a future of escaping death by manipulating the genetics of a human being with artificial intelligence. This is the same lie that the devil told Eve in the Garden of Eden, promising that she wouldn't die and that she would be like God. Genesis 127 says human beings are made in the image of God. So so the agenda of the devil is to slowly strip away the image of God here on earth and replace it with his created technology. I think that's something else I'm just not down for. I think I'll be just fine with all the natural functions that God gave me. I don't need any brain implants. I don't need any extra enhancements. I'm good. 
But uh, if you'd be down for that, let me know in the comments. Believe it or not, but these two islands, which are only about three miles apart, yet have an astonishing 20-hour time difference. Let me explain. You probably know that there's a maritime border shared by the US and Russia, running between two specific islands known as the Diomede Islands. The larger island is under Russian control, while the smaller one is American territory. Interestingly, the international date line also slices through these islands. This places Big Diomede Island a whole 20 hours ahead of Little Diomede, despite them being a mere three miles apart. In winter, the waters around these islands freeze, forming an ice bridge that connects the two nations. Crossing this bridge, you could find yourself just a step away from a completely different day. It's an almost magical experience. The closest thing we have for time traveling, I guess. But first, after all these years, the Reverend Al Sharpton admits he was an FBI informant. Yes, he says that he was the cat that got the rats, but others say that Sharpton's secret life was not by choice. CBS2 political reporter Marsha Kramer has the story. Michelle Obama probably never knew that one of the guests at her recent White House 50th birthday party was an FBI mafia informant who helped bring down members of the Genovese crime family. Reverend Al Sharpton, now a confidant of both the First Lady and the President and of Mayor Bill de Blasio, has his own unique take on his days as the government's confidential informant number seven. In my own mind, I was not an informant. I was cooperating with investigations. The revelations threaten to embarrass Sharpton as he kicks off his National Action Network convention this week with de Blasio and President Obama the headliners. But de Blasio, who called... That's hilarious. I've heard for years that uh, that he was an informant. So, you know, <laughs> for it to come out now, it, you know, I'm not too much surprised at this point. Hey, can I help you? What are you doing? And I look. Hi. What can I do for you? For you. Joe, get the fuck out of here. What are you doing? Are you trying to get in? You want me to call the police on you? What are you doing? Joe, I'm calling the police. Didn't see this footage until I finished my pizza. That's hilarious, but at the same time, that's like my worst fear. In the back of my mind, I always think like if I order pizza, what is the pizza man doing with my pizza? You know, and I think most people feel the same way. Let me know what you think in the comments, though. Hello? Yes, I'm not at your house. I'm at my house. I don't know how your camera is connected to my doorbell. I was just trying to set it up. in front of your house. Can Yay! you see what I'm pointing at?
will still sue us. Like they'll have like some accident at 60 miles an hour. They'll be dead in another car. They still sue us. You know, the guy mentioned that who fell asleep in the car and he rode over a cyclist. And, and that was what encouraged me to get autopilot out as soon as possible. I, I, I'm not kidding. He blamed it on the new car smell. What? Yes. He blamed him falling asleep on your new car smell. He got a lawyer and he sued us. And the judge was like, this is crazy. Stop bothering me. <laughs> no. Thank God. Yes. Thank God. Thank God there's a judge out there with a brain. Quite a lot of respect for the justice system. Judges are very smart. So far, I've found judges to be very good at justice. And juries are good, too. You know, you read about, like, occasional errors in the justice system. Let me tell you, most of the time, they're very good. This experiment will show you how they brought blood cells back to life using just sounds. I'm telling you, this is very real. Moreover, you'll see how, after putting sand on a sarcophagus, hieroglyphs started to appear as if they have their own frequency. What you're about to witness is so powerful, you'll want to start incorporating it into your life immediately. Keep watching all the way through. This video is loaded with mind-blowing experiments that are sure to astonish you. Let's begin. My name is John Stuart Reed. It's just receiving quiet. Amazing result. Wow, what we've just seen is absolutely amazing. It's like a real life example of what's said in the Bible. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18 21. The experiment we saw proves this in a big way. It was Anders Holti, known for his unique, kind of otherworldly music, whose voice re enlivened the cells. That's mind blowing. Of course, the point of this experiment is to showcase the power of harmonious sounds. It's not just about Anders Holte's unique ability, it's a bigger picture about good frequencies and their importance. This experiment helps us understand how vital these harmonious frequencies are. And it's not just any sound that has the power to re-enliven cells, but those that are in harmony, in tune with nature, and beneficial to our well-being. Credit for this goes to Dr. John Stuart Reed and the documentary The One Field, a film by Sipi Raz. Without this film, we might never have known about this incredible experiment. I really encourage you to watch the entire film because it's an eye-opener. You'll find links in the description. Think about it. If Anders Holte's voice, along with such beautiful and harmonious sounds, can wake up cells that were almost dead, it really makes you wonder about the music we listen to every day. Some of it is deliberately off-tune or tuned to harmful frequencies. Now, let's take a look at another one of Dr. John Stuart Reed's incredible discoveries, this time from his work in the pyramids of Egypt. Imagine this, Dr. Reed, in a setting as ancient and mysterious as the pyramids, places sand on a sarcophagus. As he conducts his experiment with sound vibrations, something absolutely phenomenal happens. Hieroglyphs begin to emerge. It's as if the sand, dancing to the tune of the vibrations, starts to unveil secrets that have been hidden for thousands of years. It all started back at the Great Pyramid in 1997. Three weeks before I was due to go out to Egypt, I severely injured my lower back. I thought I would have to cancel the whole mission, but somehow I managed to get into the pyramid. Other people carried the equipment. The experiment that was designed was to make visible the resonances in the sarcophagus. I set up the experiment, then I stretched PVC membrane across the open top of the sarcophagus. Then I sprinkled sand on the membrane. And when we switched on the sound, this is just pure tones, electronically created tones. A whole range of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs started to appear in the sand. First one was the hieroglyph for backbone or spinal column. It was writhing about like a snake. Antiquities inspector, he was like, how you do that, how you do that? We saw lots and lots of different hieroglyphs coming out on this membrane. But what was so extraordinary was within 20 minutes of making sound, all the pain in my back left me and I never did come back. It's an extraordinary moment in my life that changed my life forever. 
The remarkable healing Dr. John Stuart Reed experienced in the Great Pyramid strongly underscores the therapeutic potential of sound. His sudden relief from chronic back pain serves as a compelling testament to how sound frequencies can directly and significantly impact our physical health. This breakthrough opens thrilling new research possibilities in sound therapy and holistic healing, suggesting that sound is not just an abstract concept, but a practical tool for addressing physical health issues. This leads us to revisit the role of sound in ancient architecture. The Great Pyramid, renowned for its precision in both architecture and astronomy, may also have been intentionally designed with an intricate understanding of acoustics. Could it be that this iconic structure was more than a tomb or monument? Perhaps it served as an advanced resonant chamber for healing purposes, or other functions that we're yet to fully comprehend. The emergence of hieroglyphs in response to sound vibrations in Dr. Reed's experiment hints that the ancient Egyptians might have encoded a sophisticated understanding of sound's effects in their writing and architecture. This revelation could radically transform our understanding of ancient civilizations, suggesting they had a profound grasp of the physical and metaphysical aspects of sound. But if music and sound hold such power that they can reanimate blood cells, as seen in the previous experiment, or heal Dr. Reed's back permanently, it raises a critical question. What effect does the music we listen to, the music that's promoted everywhere, have on us? We've all seen how music can have darker, even demonic aspects. If sound can influence cells in our brain, particularly our subconscious, then the impact of our daily sonic environment becomes a matter of significant importance. Here's a clip of Michael Jackson discussing the hypnotic power of music, underscoring how deeply and subtly it can affect us. Singers, when they sing songs, it's like a mantra. When you repeat a chorus over and over and over, so when a kid hears a song and he starts singing that chorus over and over and over, then you start to hear it in the alpha state to the subconscious mind. So you start to become the song or become what you're saying. In the Bible, it speaks that there's life and death and power in the tongue. Be careful what you say. Be careful what you say. Be careful with the things you consistently talk about because you're inviting that energy and vibration into mm. your life. After hearing Michael Jackson talk about how music can transform our subconscious, much like a mantra, and Tyrese Gibson referencing the biblical verse, death and life are in the power of the tongue, were led to a crucial aspect of music. It's tuning. It's widely discussed that the standard tuning frequency for music has been shifted from its original tone, a change attributed to decisions made by entities like the Rockefeller Foundation. This shift in frequency may seem minor, but its implications are profound. Music is more than just melodies and... Hey, a lot of gems being dropped there, man. If you didn't catch that, rewind that back. Pick it up. That does resemble what we saw in Hawaii. Anybody affected in that, man, prayers going out to you. This very strange type of angel called the Ophanim. Ezekiel describes them to be these wheels within wheels, almost like a vehicle, except this thing is alive. The Bible describes them to be covered in these eerie eyes, which is kind of a mystery because even though the Ophanim are alive, Ezekiel really makes them seem like some kind of unidentified flying object. Now, Gabriel is an archangel. He has this very human appearance and believe it or not, 
God. The Bible never actually mentions him having any wings. What's very interesting is that the Bible doesn't actually say that Gabriel was an archangel. Even though this is mainstream knowledge, this piece is only found in the book of Enoch. But what about the Nephilim? Genesis 6-4 says that there were Nephilim in the earth in those days. So what did they look like? There is this ancient book called the Book of Giants. It's the story that speaks of these fallen angels who come down to earth. They bring both knowledge and absolute havoc. But what really blows my mind is just this one sentence. It literally says that these angels took 200 beasts of the field from every animal, from every bird, for miscegenation. Miscegenation is a form of crossbreeding. And in this case, it's like genetics. It's the very highest form of science. And according to this book, these angels would have been mixing and matching different animals to create something new. You see, now the question is, what would a fallen angel possibly want to create? Like the points he was trying to make, he was asking all the right questions, if you ask me. I think I was just waking up in the morning and going through the day and think. And the book has fallen apart. I mean, I've been, I've been reading this every day for over 55 years. It was 55 years a couple of weeks ago. And everything in my life started to change. Like he said in here, you've got to decide what you want. Well, I never, that never entered my mind, you know. Um, I would wake up and I just wanted to get the debts off my back. I wanted to get through the day. To think that you could sit down and take a pen and write out what you want and then get it, that was the furthest thing from my mind. I mean, I just didn't, ne that never entered my mind. But that's what he got me to do. And he talked to me for a while. Well, it ended up, I said I wanted $25,000. I mean, that would be like maybe you saying right now you want a billion dollars. I mean, it was so far out of my reach that I didn't even know anyone with $25,000. And I didn't believe it. But he said, if you do exactly what I tell you, you can have anything you want. Well, I not only didn't believe it, there was no way I could believe it. But the way he spoke to me, he had such conviction I knew he believed it. At least I believed he believed it. And then he said to me, why don't you do what I'm telling you? He said, your way's not working, mine is. He was happy, healthy, wealthy. And I couldn't even figure out why he was talking to me. And something inside me said, why don't you do what he says? So I thought, I'll try it. He said, give it a try, you've got nothing to lose. And so I said, okay. And that's really where it all started. And he gave me this book. And he said, read this every day. He got me to commit that I'd read it every day. Well, I, that's a thick book, you know, for a guy that doesn't read. I never read a book in my life. I was 26. And... Uh, you just trusted him. I started to read it. And he said, do exactly what I'm telling you, do what the book tells you. Well, my whole life changed. Just like Mr. Think and Grow Rich himself, man. That is a great book. Also, uh, As a Man Thinketh, that's also a great book. Yeah, I mean, it's a fact. It's a fact. You know, the body follows the mind, and you are a product of whatever you're thinking about. So take that in and marinate on that for a second. Well, you guys, hey, that's another one in the books. I appreciate you guys for stopping by yet again and watching another one with me. If you haven't already, do me a favor and smash that like button. Smash that subscribe button and I will definitely catch you on the next one.